All right. Welcome back to the External Medicine Podcast. My name is Daniel Belkin. I am a radiologist in Baltimore, Maryland, and I host this podcast with my brother, Mitch, who is also a radiologist here in Baltimore. We are here with Hassam. Hassam, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Daniel. Do you have any financial disclosures? Are you making any money from anyone? No. No financial disclosures. That's a shame. So we're going to do something a little different. You're doing a, a fellowship at NIH in endocrinology. You have an interesting background. You're not famous yet, but you know after this episode you will be. And uh, and you've solved some pretty like interesting cases. So we're going to go through some of those in in detail. When someone asks you about who you are and where where you come from, can can you give like a potted bio? Sure. So um, my, my background, I came from, from Baghdad, Iraq, where I did my, my medical school um, and, and four years of, of practice after graduation. Then I came here um, two years away from medicine. I was more on the bench side doing basic science. Um, then back to internal medicine where I did my residency back in New York, where we worked together uh, briefly. Um, and now I am at the National Institutes of Health doing a fellowship in endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism. And how did we meet? Uh, we met at Memorial Sloan Kettering. What do, what do you remember about meeting me at, uh, on the, what was it, lymphoma? I think it was lymphoma. It was, it was the lymphoma team. I was there very early. Um, and then uh, you, uh, I think you, you came around 15 minutes later and I said, are you the intern I'm working with? And, and, and you said yes. And and uh, it was it was an interesting week or two. So wait, so you were my brother's senior resident when he was doing his intern year at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Mm -hmm. And you know, I always I always wonder like, what was it like working with Daniel? It was very <laughs> interesting. Um, interesting. <laughs> Interesting. So here's the thing: As someone whose English is not his first language, we we learned that interesting is a good word. After six years of living in the United States, I come to realize that sometimes the word interesting is not used so nicely. But, <laughs> but Daniel is good, interesting. It was good, interesting. He he was already very well read. Um, he he had his he's very vocal about his opinions. Um, and 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 you, no, no, no. 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 Well, maybe maybe because I worked with, with a lot of people, um, many times I feel I'm in a monologue and I'm the only one p person, I'm the only person talking. And, and you know, rarely you would have um, a, a, uh, a mutual conversation or, or a dialogue rather than you being preaching to others. So you guys worked together, you were on the lymphoma service and you became, you became friends. Mm -hmm. um, I know that we wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, your your like background. I was looking over your resume, and it seems like so you were in. You're uh, originally from Baghdad, correct? Mm -hmm, correct. And you went to school there, and then you worked um, doing doing uh, both as a, a junior and senior medical officer. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious. You you were interested in. Um, I think it was like a, a few years back. You did some work with populations with high consanguinity and sort mm -hmm. of. Um, genetic problems in those populations. Like, how did you get interested in that work initially? And like, what what was it you were doing exactly then? You have to be interested in that just by by the fact that you are working in that region. Um, so, first of all, it, it, what you mentioned is correct, but it's always unusual uh, when compared to the um, the medical system in the United States. The main difference is you finish four, usually four years of med school here, and then you go to residency, and you, after that you start your career. Um, in, in many other countries across the ocean, um, what you do is, is, is different in that it's a six-year medical school, and then you go into different years of general practice. The first year is, is very similar to transitional year here, where you rotate between internal medicine, uh, different branches of surgery, um, uh, pediatrics, and GYNOB, although not always. And then after that, you do one year of uh, GP or, or general practice or, or equivalent of, of primary care physician, or maybe even a family practice, because you see all ages. 
Um, and that is usually in an underserved uh, areas, underserved uh, population in, in, in rural areas around whichever big city you, you, you were working before. Um, during that time, um, I was also uh, working as a half-time uh, or, or part-time um, with, with Doctors Without Borders. And so I was exposed to different villages around in the, in the periphery of Baghdad, to the west of Baghdad and to the south of Baghdad. And the, the more you go out, you start to encounter a lot of what seems to be very clearly genetic diseases because you start to see things either don't have names or many times undiagnosed. Sometimes if you're lucky enough, you know the diagnosis, but many times, unfortunately, you don't. The best thing you do is you have a good description and, and you, you meet families, generations, you make a, a family tree, uh, sort of a pedigree, um, which I've, I've done multiple times. And, and um, many times you don't have an answer. All what you know is it might be an autosomal dominant or, or autosomal recessive. And you give the simplest um, advice um, in, in avoid consanguinity. What, what do I mean by consanguinity? Culturally, it is accepted in, in, in many cultures that first cousins, for example, would marry each other. Um, as a matter of fact, the two villages that I remember the most from, from uh, 2016, 2017, one village, everyone has the same last name, and the other one, everyone has the same last name because they were all related. Last names being the tribe name in a way. Um, how, how, big are, how big are these villages? Not too big. I mean, I, I don't know exactly the population size. Um, add to that, there were refugee camps, so they were congested, but they are small. Uh, but but small. A few hundred? A few hundred? Or? No, I would say thousands. Um, although they are thousands very, where everyone has the same last name. Well, I haven't, I haven't met everyone, but all the people I met had, had the same last name and, and they would tell you that they are not related to the other person who has the same last name, but <laughs> theoretically, you know that they, they all come from, from one uh, common ancestor, which is, I think is known in genetics as, as the, the, the bottleneck, uh, phenomenon where, where for, for some reason, some populations, um, are, are related to each other and and as such you see very high incidence of of rare diseases i have an example that i remember very well um i i was in a mobile mobile clinic which is basically a bus that goes through um and and i had a a young patient she was six years old um at that time and um i i don't recall exactly why why she, maybe it was for some simple urinary tract infection or, or something, but I noticed something very clearly. There was a significant uh, eye changes, very, very strong, uh, very severe myopia um, and uh, esotropia, uh, obesity. Uh, the BMI was more than 35 and, and she was only six. Um, when I asked the mother that there was significant hyperphagia and the answer was, was not on what you see on the physical examination, but what was removed. When you look at her, there was a scar here and there was a scar here of a removal of extra digits. So this is a classical, they didn't know that there is a diagnosis. When you put them all together, severe obesity, high myopia, proteinuria, uh, and, and, and uh, renal problems, and um, polydactyly, that would immediately uh, signal to you that it's a ciliopathy, it's a disease of cilia, um, and it has an eponym, uh, Lawrence Moon or, or Bardet Beadle uh, syndrome. When you read about them, uh, and, and one of the websites that I used to use a lot, and I still go to when I'm, when I'm in a hurry, is uh, uh, NORD, N-O-R-D, which I think was Organization of Rare Diseases, um, you see the incidence quickly and, and you realize it's a rare disease, so it has an incidence of one in 100,000. But there was one study in Kuwaiti Bedouin, um, or, or it could be Bedouin from other areas in the Gulf region. The incidence is as high as one in a thousand or one in 1,200. Um, and again, what what might be a rare disease in the West where most of literature comes is, I don't think it's, it's truly rare um, and big part of it 
might be related to, to consanguinity. That was a long tangent, I think. I'm trying to remember, did I answer Mitch's question? How did I become into consanguinity? That's why, exposure, where, where you are working. Very interesting. <laughs> Good interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we we worked together. I mean, the 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 thing I remember about Hassam is there was this guy who came into who was on our service that had uh this basically something that looked like lymphoma, but we couldn't find lymphoma anywhere, but he was still on the cancer service. HLH. Uh, HLH, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so everything seemed to suggest HLH, but we had biopsied him many times. It couldn't it wasn't uh it wasn't proven. And Hassam had a really interesting idea. I don't know if it ended up being true, but uh, maybe walk us through some of your thinking on that case because you spoke up and you're like, oh, it could be this. Uh, and uh, it was pretty fascinating. Unfortunately, that case is, is, is not fully solved uh, regardless. But, you know, the idea is sometimes there are diseases that are clear and the, diagno- the way to reach a diagnosis is clear and you can order it in, in whatever EMR you're using using and uh, the whatever test is done and then results are back and you have a diagnosis in a way or another. But sometimes you really have to think outside the box and and, and, and the, the, given my interest in basic science and pathophysiology, I, I always think from that uh, perspective, how what might be the process? How, how would you be able to find the diagnosis? Um, now, in, in that particular case, it was a proven HLH. Um, and, and HLH is, I, I didn't mention it, it's hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. It's a, it's a disorder where subset of the um, innate immune system takes over. It's an exaggerated immune response and that arm of immunity, predominantly monocyte macrophage uh, system, and there is multi-systemic um, inflammatory response. You see this in almost every organ once once that process starts. And perhaps one of the most common causes of HLH is hematological malignancies. Um, and, and, and that's one reason why um, adults, when diagnosed with HLH, first thing you would do is you would, you would look for malignancy. Yes, there are some cases with, with solid malignancy. There are always cases with, with every possible malignancy, but the most common one is, is hematological and certain, certain lymphomas, that's why. He was, um, uh, that, that person was in the service. Uh, but an extensive search um, for, for a hematological malignancy was non yielding. Um, as such, one of the things that I, I, I used to do and I still do is when I, when I see a combination of symptoms or sign or manifestations uh, uh, or, 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 or a disease that I, I'm un- unsure about it. So we have a diagnosis, but we don't. We need an etiology. Um, I would go to pediatrics um, literature, whether textbooks or, or whether Nelson is one of my favorites. Um, and the reason is what I usually say is um, kids who have diseases at one point they will grow up and become adults. You may you may be the first person to encounter them and think that maybe they have a disease that usually manifests the pediatrics age group. Um, and indeed, there is a subset of HLH that is monogenic, meaning there is a single gene, it's a single gene disorder that would manifest as HLH. Some of the famous ones like Shidiak Higashi um, and, and related disorders where the problem is in, in cell, some of them have cellular trafficking problem where certain vesicles are unable to be excreted from immune cells. So you have a defect in one arm of immunity, the other arm takes over. It's not targeted because the, the it's not the adaptive immune response, No, not the T cells and B cells. So uh, you have uh, a chaotic uh, immune response. Um, so that was that's one concept. Consider pediatric disorder manifesting late. Why would they, why would they do that? It might be a new mutation in a known target, but the mutation is not fully deleterious. It would be hypomorphic or hypofunctioning rather than fully uh, loss of function. So there might be a second hit required to to make it manifest later on. That's one possibility. The other possibility that I always think about is it could be acquired, but targeting the same target. And I'll give you an example. 
in basic science, there are two uh, two terms used a lot uh, when when you're dealing with 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 a disease model. Let's suppose a mouse model. Uh, you have knockout and knockdown uh, model. So the knockout is genetically engineered to have either deletion or or insertion or transgenic or or or, or, or whatever. Let, let's suppose it's a genetic modification to result in a loss of function. This is knockout or KO, um, and it will have some manifestations. And you you study the, the phenotype to have a better understanding of what's happening in in humans because you you are able to do more deep phenotyping with with, with animals. That's knockout. Sometimes you are able to have a similar phenotype without the the difficult um, process to do genetic engineering by using, for example, monoclonal antibodies. So you have knockdown or sometimes not monoclonal antibodies targeting protein. You may be targeting RNA using uh, small interfering RNAs or, or, or CIRNAs. So, you know, so the, the other way to look at it, you know, the central dogma of molecular biology, DNA, RNA, and protein, and you can interfere at any level. You can do some mutation in the DNA and that's, you have a knockout. The equivalent of which in humans is monogenic disorder that usually manifests in the pediatric age group, but that doesn't mean that they don't manifest later on. You have then RNA, you know, uh, trans transcription of DNA to RNA, and that you can interfere with that using small interfering RNAs, uh, and you have a knockdown phenotype. I'm unaware of a disease in a human that can manifest that way, but th there are recently some data about RNA, uh, certain RNA-related disorders, and some of them even related to thyroid cancer from a paper that came last week. But you have a protein as well, which is the most important part. It, diseases manifest when, when the protein is affected, and you can have antibody uh, against that, which can induce the same phenotype. And I'll give you two examples on the top of my head. You have um, calcium sensitive receptor. Uh, you can have a mutation in it, and that would result either in a loss or gain of function. And you have the uh, classical familial um, hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. You can have the same phenotype. Uh, you do the genetics, and it's negative. You check for antibodies. They have autoantibody against the same protein. So you have this knockout versus knockdown. Uh, you get you get the idea. So basically, it's like. Um you know, here, here's a disease. So we we're looking for a malignancy. We can't find it in this guy. So a, a possibility is that he has the, a pediatric version and so do, one of the possible, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So you do genetics in that case, um, or the alternative, if the genetics come back negative, you start to look for possible new novel antibodies that were not described before targeting any of the known, whatever you tested for, um, perforin, granzyme, um, I don't remember which enzymes uh, that are involved in, in natural killer killing. You you try to find antibodies against these proteins that are known to be mutated in the pediatric genetic version of the disease, um, and and people find that all the time uh, when, when you have a very a phenotype that is very suggestive of a genetic disease. You do genetics and it's negative. You start to look for other antibodies. Most genetics are. I have to be clear. Most of the genetic testing is done by exome sequencing. A negative exome sequencing may not fully exclude the genetic cause. Some mutations are in the introns, so you may need to dig deeper. But always have the idea of going into autoantibodies. There was one person who's one of my my, my heroes in the NIH, although not in the endocrine uh, department, but he's in and he is an infectious disease specialist. His name is, is Steve Holland, who I've been following his work uh, for for a while. He he had. He was contacted for a group of uh, middle-aged women who were having what seems to be primary immune deficiency. Again, disorder known to affect pediatric age group. Um, but uh, after investigation, they could his group couldn't find any genetic cause of their primary immune deficiency. They found autoantibodies against um, interferon pathway, um, and and. Um, that's another example of, of, of a disease that, that manifests later and, and the cause is, is an, an acquired knockdown rather than knockout, mm. protein targeting rather than DNA. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the cases that you yourself solved. Um, we were talking about them a little teeny bit before we started recording. Um, 
Why don't we start with the child syndrome case that you mentioned? There are diseases that when you look at the patient, you don't see anything visible. And these require a lot of um, detective, detective work and a lot of um, uh, cerebral energy. And, and, and um, you may reach an answer or not. But there, there are many conditions where the phenotype is very obvious and you can see it with your eye. You don't need a microscope, you don't need an image, and, and, and you can just see it. what is called a spot diagnosis. Um, these are usually easy to, to suspect. And once you suspect you have a target to do a confirm, either do a confirmation test or sometimes the clinical manifestations are um, diagnostic in, in, in their own. There is always a possibility of another explanation, but that I'll give example here. Um, in in March 2017, um, I was in uh, one of the uh, remote rural areas uh, in the south of Baghdad. Um, as as I told you, as as a primary care or, or general practitioner, and um, you see a lot of patients, um, more than 50, sometimes even more than 70 a day. Uh, it's very different from, from the U.S. Uh, because of the ratio of, of, of patients to, to physicians. Um, as such, you are exposed to a lot of patients, all age groups. And I remember there was a, a father coming with, 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 with his daughter who was 15 months at that time. Um, she was, they were there just for vaccinations. Uh, they, were, they were getting their MMR. Uh, and I was very concerned for what seems to be surgical site infection, because the patient had an external fixator, you know, the, the Elizalov external fixator that, that you used for, for lengthening uh, of, of a limb. And, and around the pins were really angry looking um, rashes. Um, it's it's ichthyotic to, to describe it. Um, so even though the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, parent of the patient was interested only in the vaccine, I was interested to make sure that this is not a surgical site infection. So I said, I need to take a look at this. Maybe we will have to refer you to get the, the fixator removed. He said, no, 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 don't worry about it. This has been there since birth. And that's it. You have, you have your diagnosis. Um, because if it showed, if the rash happened after the uh, the insertion of the pins, yes, you suspect reaction, maybe allergic, but more seriously, surgical site infection, uh, because these are foreign bodies going in. Um, but when you have the story of someone using something needed for limb lengthening, which I didn't tell you, but there is a, a, a limb defect with a rash on the same side, this is suggestive of one or, or two diseases only. Um, and, and it's called child syndrome. Um, child stands for congenital hemiechthyosis uh, with ipsilateral limb defect, C-H-I-L-D. What it means is it's a disease that affects one side of the body, most commonly the right, and I'll tell you why, which what she had. Um, and you would see two manifestations mainly, um, abnormal limb development. It could be both upper and lower extremity, or it could be just one of them. Um, there's variable uh, 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 presentation. And on the same side, really severe and difficult to treat ichthyosis. Um, and I'll be honest with you, um, I was not much into molecular biology at that time. I was only clinical physician, so I knew the diagnosis. and I didn't know what's the, the pathophysiology behind it, and I could not tell you where the mutation would be. Um, uh, so I, I asked him, who who are you seeing for this? And he said, well, there was a, a team of orthopedic surgeons elsewhere dealing with the limb lengthening, and there was a dermatologist who was trying to try multiple things, and they were not working for the skin. I said, but, but the, the answer is one, actually. Um, and I, I wrote it on a piece of paper, the diagnosis, and I gave it to him, and, and I said, um, if, if you go to either the orthopedic or the dermatologist, tell them that this is one disease, um, and... Um, that might be helpful to have a diagnosis. I wanted him to come back in six months to follow up. Um, I wanted to make sure that there is no cataract because um, there is another disease that called Conradi-Hunerman syndrome. 
That is very similar also limb defect and ichthyosis, but they usually have cataracts. Almost 90% by birth, uh, and, and some of them by the end of the first year. So for someone who didn't have any access to any, any labs or any sophisticated genetics, the way to differentiate between both is, is focus on the eye. If, if she doesn't develop cataract really by the age of two, this is most likely child syndrome rather than the other one, Conrad Hunerman. Little did I know later after I learned about the, the molecular biology of this is that these two diseases are of two consecutive enzymes in one pathway. So they are, they are very related. Um, and, and, and theoretically, if you have a treatment for one, you, can, you may be able to treat the other. Um, child syndrome is very rare. There are like 350 cases in the, in the last 100 years. Um, there is no known treatment for the skin, as far as I know. I was trying to aim for the skin, but I didn't know what to do. Anyhow, they never come back. It was the end of my, um, my one year as general practitioner in that, in that village, and I, I didn't hear back from him, but I was very curious. I really wanted to, to know. I, I didn't have anything in mind. I didn't have a treatment plan. I, didn't, I just wanted to know what happened. Why did they come back? Luckily, I had um, photographs um, of, of the patient after... Um, the, the father consented. So I showed it to, um, I, I remember she came on that date. You can see the date on the, on the, on the image. And I knew she was there for MMR. So I went to the vaccination big uh, uh, notebook and I went to that March 17 or, or whatever. And then there were only three kids taking MMR at that day. So there, there was a boy that's excluded and there are two other, other girls. And, uh, and, and look at their father, father's name uh, and, and try to find them. So, the, uh, the, the person who was uh, responsible for the vaccination records, he said, I know both of them, where, where do they live? It's a small village. So we went out on these unpaved roads. Um, you walk on the mud, on the mud basically, um, and, and knocking doors one, one after another. And, and it's, it's, a, it's an unusual scenario when I, when I look back into it, but I'm glad I did. Um, first one, it was not. It was not her. The second one, not her. And, 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 and people started, I started to think, what am I doing? Here. Um, and then finally, I, I, I reached out one one place, and, and I noticed that an old woman came in, and I said, do you know this little girl? She said, this is my granddaughter. What, what do you want? <laughs> and uh, she was, she, she was uh, you know, um, concerned, and, and she called her son, and he said, there is someone looking for, for, for my granddaughter. I don't know what's going on here. And he came, he came out, and he said, oh, I know him. He's, he's the doctor's village. He, he treated my, my back pain. Um, so uh, and he, so he, he welcomed me warmly and he said, oh, how can I help you? And, and I told him the story and I told him, I think I know the diagnosis. I want to follow up what happened. Um, he said, oh, they moved to a different city, but he gave me the contact information. I was able to uh, get in touch with them, um, but the, the, nothing interesting happened in the next year. What is interesting happened a year later, um, I got... Uh, my, my scholarship to, to uh, go to NYU doing my molecular biology. And for some reason, I ended up in an atherosclerosis labs. And, and you would think, what does atherosclerosis have to do with this? Um, I was dealing with macrophages and we were, it's totally, so I, for, I totally forgot about this. I, I was dealing with macrophages for, for two years in, in my life in, in petri dishes. I would get them from mice and uh, look at cholesterol synthesis pathway and, and treat, the, treat macrophages with different statins. And I, I had to repeat the experiment 11 times because it didn't work. The experiment didn't work, but I got an answer from it. Um, I, I remember by the 11th time, my PI, he said, you know what, just take the day off. There's someone coming in, in Rockefeller giving a lecture. You should go and meet him. His name is... Uh, is, is Goldstein. I didn't know who Goldstein was, but it turns out he's a Nobel laureate who won the Nobel Prize for the LDL receptor work in either 1984 or 1985. Uh, I was mesmerized by this. Um, and and while, he was, while he was going over, over the work on, he did over, over decades on, co on cholesterol synthesis pathway and LDL receptor, and I saw, oh, that's the enzyme that, that caused the mutation. It's called NSDHL. Um, and well, how do I connect this? It turns out that before statins, patients with familial hypercholesterolemia used to be treated with ketoconazole because ketoconazole is an inhibitor of, although it's used 
to inhibit the uh, as as antifungal, but it has an inhibitory effect on cholesterol synthesis, and in really high doses. Now, as a fellow in endocrinology, you can use it in Cushing disease, Cushing syndrome, to inhibit uh, steroidogenesis. That that pathway, because again, steroids come from cholesterol, and that pathway from cholesterol to steroids, you can inhibit all of that with ketoconazole. Now, guess what? Ketoconazole comes not only as oral form, but as a topical form. So I immediately had the, the aha moment that this disease, which is a disorder of, of cholesterol synthesis pathway, somatic, it's not in every cell in the body, it's only in patches. So that's why you have one side affected, not the other, the right, not the left, because the left side die in utero because the heart is involved most of the times. You can really target these patches of skin that have toxic byproduct of incomplete cholesterol synthesis with simple topical ketoconazole. I was very excited about the idea. I, I had the patient's contact information. I called them. And, and by the way, you can even use statins. If you can convert statins from oral pills to a, a topical form, you can use it. And there are cases reported that it works. The only problem, I couldn't, I couldn't get anyone in Iraq to convert any statin to, to a, a cream um, or lotion or whatever topical form. There was only one person doing it in Lebanon. Um, he wasn't willing to... to uh, to, to send it to, to Iraq. He, that didn't work. But ketoconazole is a good option. It's cheap. It's safe when you use it topically. Uh, I, I assembled a group of people. But again, I was here. I, I needed someone to do the work. So I reached out to my colleagues. One of them was dermatologist. One was pediatrician and a radiologist. And I'll tell you why. Uh, because um, I wanted to know the right side of the body internally, if there are any uh, phenotypic features. And there was one thing, if you go to the protein expression, you, you see high expression in the esophagus. And I wanted to see if there are any abnormality in the esophagus. And indeed there was, although we still don't know what it is exactly. Um, long story short, we were able to get um, ketoconazole. We, we got approval from our alma mater, uh, to, uh, which is much simpler than IRB here. Uh, you, you present your case. Um, you, you, you show that this is a, an old, safe, medication, you're going to use it for six months or, or whatever. We want to use it for six months to see an effect. Um, and we will follow up with LFTs, uh, lipid panel, uh, and, and, and maybe vitamin D, because remember, vitamin D also comes from uh, that pathway. And, and indeed, she had vitamin D deficiency, uh, although I cannot connect them. Many people have vitamin D deficiency. Um, what, what was very, very uh, rewarding is... In six months, most of the lesions cleared fully. Um, and um, I, I unfortunately don't have the, 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 the photographs on, on, on my laptop, but I'll, I'll, I may be able to show you uh, later. Um, it's, and also, it will be published soon. Um, uh, it was safe. There was no, uh, although it's N equal one, I, I didn't encounter any other patients. But by the time she was in, in, in school, um, the skin almost fully cleared some areas back to normal and some areas down from really red to just scales uh, with, with normal skin underlying. So they were very happy. Um, I was happy, even though my experiments with macrophages didn't work for 11 times. Um, it, it inspired another idea. So that, that's, that's the story with child syndrome. And also in retrospect, I was glad that I, roamed the village until I found uh, I was able to trace them, even though I didn't have a plan at that time, but I, I just had a hunch one day I may have an idea and I, I would need to, to keep uh, in touch with, with, with the patients. How did you know about child syndrome as a recent like medical graduate? Like, was it something that you learned from reading Nelson's or just like that you picked up in your, your coursework? It seems like a very, you said there are only 350 documented cases. How did you know about that? So, um, yes, it's mentioned in Nelson. Um, I, I, on that day I, I wasn't, so I, I have to be honest with you. I wasn't hundred percent certain on, on day one. So I went back to to, med, to my med school, even though I graduated, I went back to to find Fitzpatrick Dermatology uh, textbook 
And that's what I learned about the Conrad Hunerman, which is the similar one. I didn't know about it before. And by the way, Conrad Hunerman is part of the same cholesterol synthesis pathway. It's a defect. It's it's a phenocopy of the same disease, but with, with ocular involvement. Um, but how did I know about this? Um, it's, it's an extreme phenotype. Uh, once you see it, uh, at least for me, you, you, do, you don't forget it. And um, I told you, it's a spot diagnosis. You see it once and, and that's it, you, you, you know it. I, I must have seen it somewhere, either in med school. I cannot recall exactly when. Uh, maybe, I used to go over a lot of images. Um, I am a very visual person and, and, and one, shit, one, one thing I didn't mention is I was going to become a radiologist for that reason. Uh, but um, that's a, that's another story. Um, but but if you see the images, you don't forget it. The the only reason I suspected, I did not fully suspect the diagnosis is when you see the photo photos that are published, um, you see the entire half of the body affected. So one half that's fully normal, and the other half is fully erythematous, angry looking, uh, ichthyotic crash. But my patient didn't look like that. It's only the upper extremity and patches on the ipsilateral lower extremity, back of the knee and, and, and the foot. And interestingly, every part that is affected, the underlying bone is abnormal. So on the foot, the fourth toe skin is affected, but the fourth toe is also atrophic. So, so you later on, I, I needed to, to make sure that child syndrome can have a milder phenotype. And, and yes, of course, every disease can have a milder phenotype. But again, I was a recent graduate and I didn't know the nuance. Let's talk about some of the other interesting cases that you've uh, that you've encountered. Let's talk about the the girl who came in who had post measles encephalitis or something like that. Oh yes, um, was one of the cases that I encountered um, in residency. See, I was in intern, so that was around three years ago. Um, primary care the West post-discharge follow-up. So uh, the patient was recently admitted for an unusual um, uh, un unusual uh, problems. Th there was the admission for non-STEMI um, and the workup for the non-STEMI led to imaging, like the, the chief complaint was, was sore throat and with the sore throat assessment revealed Severe hypertension, the severe hypertension later on uh, was accompanied with some chest pain that triggered the suspicion for aortic dissection, but it didn't show that it was actually elevated troponin. But the image that didn't go all the way down showed some filling defect in, in the aorta. So there was an extension of the image and there was huge infarct. Literally the, the aorta below uh, the, 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 the SMA, the superior mesenteric artery was, was fully uh, clotted. Um, she was treated, she was doing, and, and there was like what I call a diagnostic odyssey. They did a million dollar workup to try to find out the cause of the coagulopathy, but really nothing was, was screaming. He, you know, when, when you do coagulopathy workup, you, sometimes you see mildly elevated or reduced value and, and you have to repeat it. You repeat it and it's normal and that doesn't mean that it's, it's the cause. So point is there was, there was un, it's a constellation of unusual symptoms, the coagulopathy, non-STEMI, hypertension. Um, and you read in the chart, most of the notes, it says post-measles encephalitis. And, and that, was, that was the thing that I, I was personally curious about because I'm not an infectious disease expert. I'm not an neurologist. I'm not post measles encephalitis expert. But what I know is there are two forms of post measles encephalitis. Uh, there is a transient form that happens during the the acute illness or after the acute illness, and that's usually self-resolving. Um, and there is a very rare form which you all read about in med school, the SSPE, subacute sclerosing pancreatitis deadly diagnosis. I don't think this patient had SSPE because you see that mentioned for years in the, in the chart, but she managed to be alive. And it's not the acute thing that happened years ago because that's still resolving. So I, I, I was curious really about that, even though I, I was supposed to follow up 
the blood pressure, the the, the non STEMI, the reason which I did, um, but I was curious about this. So I asked a lot of questions. The, the patient, the patient had had, well, it can be labeled as as uh, on the spectrum of autism disorder, somewhat nonverbal, um, developmental delay, cannot take care of themselves, family members um, were accompanying. So I was asking them and. I asked many questions. One of them was, oh, by the way, tell me about what, what's with the measles and how did that, because I was looking at the chart, I couldn't find like a documented, for example, neurology consult or something like that. Um, the, the patient's mother was there and, and she said, well, when she was young, around two years, she got sick. I think it was measles, not 100% sure. And after that, when she, she did not recover. Um, somehow that translated into the chart as post measles encephalitis and were propagated um, throughout most of the notes. Um, so you know you're, you're dealing with something else. And once you know you're dealing with something else, you almost have a diagnosis because you put them together. There is only few syndromes that can cause uh, developmental delay or predominantly neurological manifestations with a thrombophilia. I remember presenting my case to my attending and he said, so what test do you want to do today? I said, I have only one test I want to, to check. He said, what? I said, almost a steel level. Indeed, it was the only thing that was not checked. Um, I ordered almost a steel, takes forever to come back. By that time, I had the chance to go over, you know, when you review charts from other hospitals, everything happened in, in the last 10 years, you, you get these data because... I need the bigger picture, and they told me there were hospitalizations elsewhere. Um, and I found D DVTs, um, two or three, and I found notes from ophthalmology assessing the patient for lens dislocation. So I, I knew it, it's going to be homocystinuria even before it comes back because, you know, it, everything you review makes the case more and more suggestive of that. Um, I think two weeks later, the levels came back. Normal range is 10 to 12 uh, millimolar per liter. At that point, it was more than 500, which is more than you can measure, like the, the, more than the upper performance of the test. Um, so you have a diagnosis, um, and we start the treatment. At the, now the treatment is another uh, another story, uh, but um, the, the diagnosis, in a way, by the way, one thing I there are two things I want to mention. Um, there's a lot of information I mentioned, but um, the, the the family really were very very grateful that they have a kind of closure uh, diagnostically, um, and um, they they became active with 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 organizations and, and, and associations that have other patients. I, I introduced them to, there was a, a, a group in Michigan, uh, like a homo, American homocystinuria uh, association or, or, or organization, something like that. So they became part of it and, and, and um, they, they wanted to, to increase awareness more about it. Um, and, and when I told them that I'm considering publishing it and including your, your, your input, and they, they were very happy to, to uh, increase the awareness about that um, because you would think that it's an easy diagnosis to make, but for some reason, there are many cognitive biases that possibly impair that diagnosis. And by the way, I presented that case multiple times to many other residents, colleagues, medical students, they all knew the diagnosis. So, so there is a disconnect between describing an illness when you know the diagnosis. E everyone will know what you're talking about. It's like when I tell you, oh, the middle-aged man comes in with central crushing chest pain. Once I use these words, it's a buzz, it's an exam buzzwords, and you immediately start thinking coronary artery disease. But for some reason, when you see that person come through your doors, it does not fully translate to that in the maybe in the beginning of practice. 
if you are a cardiologist and you've seen a lot of coronary artery disease, acute coronary syndromes, you start to know, know what it looks like. So that disconnect into how to translate what you are seeing into a buzzword triggering illness script, that, that is something that in retrospect, I think was very important. Um, my curiosity mainly was about this, it's like post measles encephalitis, you don't see this quite often on a chart. That led to, to, to the diagnosis. Once you excluded what was not really there, so in this particular case, what, what happened with the, the treatment? Treatment. So that was, uh, to begin with, that was probably my second homocystinoid case. Uh, in, in med school, there was one that I saw. Uh, there was, an, the point is N equal two. I don't have a lot of experience I need to, to read about it. And we didn't have a geneticist. I told them that I can refer them to a geneticist where they wanted to get the treatment. There, you read about treatment, and the treatment is basically 50% would respond to vitamin B6 uh, or, or pyridoxine. The reason is the classical homocystinuria is a defect in an enzyme called cystathione beta synthase. It's an enzyme that's involved in sulfur containing uh, amino acids, predominantly methionine. And, and when there is a, a defect in that enzyme, a byproduct goes up, similar to a byproduct of cholesterol metabolism I told you about that manifested in the skin and the bones of the other patient. Here, the tropism is in the brain and the vessels for many, many reasons. Um, but it's, it's the same principle. How can, you, how can you overcome that defect? In that other patient, I was able to inhibit the whole cholesterol pathway with ketoconazole. Here, there are multiple things you can do. You can provide cofactor for the enzyme, and it seems in 50, around 50% 50 of the patients would respond to very high dose of, of pyridoxine. We are speaking like, probably more than 10 times recommended daily allowance. It's around 10, 10 milligrams per kg. Um, I had difficulty to order that. I have to converse the pharmacist. What I was dealing with, um, the pharmacist finally approved. We got that. There was a response, but not normalization. So you divide them after that into non-responders, partial responders, and, and responders. With responders, it's great news. That's all they need usually. Um, but. In my case, it was not good enough. It, it brought levels down to the 200s, but it seems that you need to bring the levels down. I told you it was more than 500 in the beginning. You need to bring it below 100. Below 100 seems still high, but at least that's a level that, for some reason, it has been agreed upon that you would uh, prevent further clotting. Um, so what else would you do? Um, I started to reach out to, to people, experts in the field, um, if, if, if you may. And, and one of them is, is here, I think, actually in, in, in DC, um, in, in Children's Hospital. Um, and um, I said, this is what I have. I started B6, it didn't work. Now I need help. Because I know there is another treatment, but I, I didn't know how to prescribe it. It's something called betaine. Um, and, and I'll tell you what this does. She, um, I, she immediately got back to me. Um, she said, you have, you seem to have a case of classical homocystinuria, and I agree with you, I think you need to be tamed. I know two people in New York can help you. Um, she connected us, um, and um, a, a physician in, 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 um, in Einstein, what, Montefiore, Einstein, Some, somewhere in Bronx, I think, um, accepted the patient in like a, one week, uh, they were started on uh, betaine, which is, um, it's derived from beta vulgaris, or, or beets. Uh, hence the name betaine. The, the structure, is, it's, it's, a, it's like a glycine amino acid, but with the three methyl groups. And these methyl groups are donated to that homocysteine. Once you put the methyl back, you have methionine again, which is relatively harmless. Well, it does not have, methane is not relatively harmless. Very high methane can affect the brain, can cause cerebral edema. Um, so you have to watch for this. But it lowers homocysteine. Um, and, and, and with that, you need also to, to follow a certain diet, avoiding uh, methionine. So by the time I was able to, to get that process going, I suggested a vegan or, or vegetarian vegan diet, um, which further worked to, to lower down hemocysteine because most of these comes from, from meat and, 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 and other uh, food components that, that are rich in, in methionine. Once you go to a vegan diet, you really 
get much lower methionine. Um, and finally, the, the final treatment, uh, betaine, um, you add a um, certain amino acid formula that has 19 amino acids except methionine to make sure that there is no nutritional deficiency while being vegan. Uh, and because there, there's basically no protein. Okay, I take it back, not necessarily vegan, no protein. Um, that's why you need the amino acid supplement as well to supplement the other essential amino acids. And, and there was really, I mean, you learn about developmental milestones in pediatrics and, and, and you think by the age of mid-30s, you cannot gain things back. But really, there was surprising improvement in the mood. Um, sleep, wake cycle improved. The, the patient could not sleep before that, which was very difficult for the caregivers. Um, and more attentive started learning some words, communicating. Um, so they, they were very, very, very grateful um, to see more changes that they just considered to be the usual. Um, but the point is, even though it, the diagnosis was late, um, unfortunately, by the way, this disorder is screened for in the US. The, the patient was not born in the US. She was born in a country where screening is, I think, still not implemented. Um, and, and, and even with screening, by the way, some cases are, are missed. Your uh, mention of things getting propagated in the chart, the uh, post-measles encephalitis, somebody mentions the word encephalitis, measles, it's put down and then copy forwarded. I had a, um, a patient during my intern year who there was reference to um, a splenectomy, pancreatectomy as a result of a gunshot wound mm -hmm. and, you know, going into radiology, I was very curious. I was like, I wonder what the, the imaging for this looks like, because assuredly, if you get shot there, there's somebody who's going to want to get a CT scan of that before you do surgery. And so I went back to the time point at which this happens in the patient's chart. They had been in the hospital. There were like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of notes between the time point that this happened and when I saw the patient each one mentioning this gunshot wound to the, you know, to the abdomen causing the splenectomy, pancreatectomy. The patient was never shot in the abdomen. They had shrapnel in them mm -hmm. in a different part of the body and separately had a pancreatectomy, splenectomy for totally unrelated reasons. But hundreds and hundreds of times in the chart, people are just writing the same thing forward, forward, forward. So uh, that was a... Uh, a very, very interesting case. You see this a lot. Yes, I, 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 I hear you. It was one of the things that is still, in a way, a cultural shock for me. Coming from from Iraq, we, we so we had different problems. We didn't have uh, electronic medical system. Um, it was paper based, and most times papers are lost. So you will reinvent the wheel every time you see the patient. You take history from scratch, but. Uh, that at least got me comfortable to go see the patient before charts reviewing. That at least, at least when I was in, in residency, when I, new admission, okay, let's go see the patient. Because you get information sometimes really, really much more reliable than, than whatever you read. Um, I am always cautious about what, what I read. And, and even when I when I review, I, I prefer to go over objective data, images, um sometimes even before reports um and and um lab lab, lab data and, and, and something like that and, and then i would start to go over the thought process and the illness script that was scripted by uh others yeah i think i saw something that's like 50 percent of the chart is copy forward maybe maybe more i'm trying to remember the there was, some, there was something that came out like last year about this I would I would not be surprised. Uh, there is, it seems that there's also an expectation for longer notes, which sometimes I just don't get, um, and and that copy forward sometimes really brings uh, brings more bulk to to the to the body of the note, and which is sometimes not really um, required. Yeah, the way I, the way I see it is like the length. It's it's like when you're doing an essay for school, your teacher says, "Oh, you have to write this essay." And you know, if you just write something really long, it makes it seem like you did more work. 
And I think that there's a similar thought, maybe unconscious thought process in medicine, where if you just make a long note, it translates to the people that oversee you as having done a lot of work, like billing or whatever the, whoever, whoever looks over your shoulder. I mean, I have, this is just my sheer conjecture on my part, but that's what I feel like is, is part of the driver. It is. I I think I fully agree with you, but, but, you know, the other thing is, is uh, these, these different biases, you know, people mention a lot anchoring bias, you read things and you just assume, well, that's what it is. Um, All of us, none of us was a post measles encephalitis expert. So none, none of us questioned that. And all of us just anchored on, on that and move forward with, with, with it. So you have that 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 bias to be aware of among among many others. You know there is a, a lot of cognitive biases, and, and they are. I think they are all important when you think about diagnoses. Um, the these two cases I mentioned so far they are they are different in that the external appearance is different. The first one you really don't need cognitive bias. You have seen this before. It triggers a thought. It's it's the fast. Uh, thinking process. The other one is, is a little bit slower that, that requires um, going back and asking questions and, and th- until things make make sense. All right, let's let's talk about one one more of your cases and we'll we'll save the rest for a future episode. Um, let's talk about your hypercalcemia case. Set, set the stage for that one. That so this is I think is much shorter and it's, it's much simpler. The reason is I was I think I was also an intern in that year. Uh, the, I was on the inpatient service, and and and, and my colleague, the, the patient was not mine. It was followed by my co-intern, um, and and there was a patient who I, I knew they were following for hypercalcemia. Peripherally, I didn't know the details, um, but I've heard on on rounds someone mentioning also. We still don't know the answer, the the cause, and I was intrigued. Um, and I remember staying up late at night, like to one or two a.m. until I, I figured out the cause. Uh, because you know, in turn year, you're busy. You have to deal with with your ten patients, and and if you have an extra time uh, before you go to bed, you you may check on on on, on other things. Um, it turns out that that patient was normal calcemic really throughout um, throughout the admission, and the admission was for. A fracture. Um, the patient already had um, hip replacement. They sustained the fall, and after the fall, the uh, there was a fracture around the prosthesis, and that required uh, a replacement. It was done successfully. A day later, there was an acute psychotic episode um, that was unexplained with with. Um, agitation and 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 the, the mental status was really different which was again not in the past medical history of the patient so that was unusual but it it happened to coincide on the same day that uh, a blood work was drawn showing calcium levels i think was 15 or 16 which is very high upper limit being around 10 10 and a half maybe um and so i, I and again i was looking all in retrospect because i i haven't seeing the patient at that point. Parathyroid hormone was very suppressed. So that's the main thing when you try to diagnose a cause of hypercalcemia, whether, whether it's PTH dependent or not, because you want to know whether this is a cause that comes from the parathyroid glands or somewhere else. PTH being suppressed, meaning that the parathyroid glands are normally responding to high calcium and, and by negative feedback, PTH is going down. So you start looking somewhere else. Um, vitamin D was low actually, um, uh, 125 came back normal, uh, PTH RP came back normal. So kind of makes malignancy unusual, but again, the story itself also makes all, all the other causes unlikely. It, it's something that happened overnight. So I was, I told you, I go over the objective data and, and, and sometimes you have a hypothesis, you go for certain things, you, you, your search is directed, and, and many times you don't. You try to review all the data. I didn't know what's going on, so I started to review all the data. And there was the answer in front of me. Um, when you you've review the images, the reason, again, why I didn't, I told you, I don't go over the, the, um, the report of the image, go over the image, because there are things that are sometimes 
not commented about. I mean, you know, you you are in radiology. You comment on what's important. There are things that you see, but you don't want to write four or five pages report, uh, right? One of the things that I noticed is operation was successful. There was a fracture, and now there's a prosthesis. Um, orthopedic surgeons, to avoid infection, use calcium sulfate beads. And these are uh, space fillers. If you fill the space, you would uh, reduce the risk of infection, but also sometimes are mixed with antibiotics. So you, you have a, a paste and, and, and sometimes mixed with um, vancomycin or even other antibiotics, and, and, and you put them in whatever you have a, a significant large space left rather than just closing the space. Um, so you see the calcium sulfate beads were there, and a day later, half of them is gone. And two days later, I think they were fully absorbed very quickly. They, they, they take months to get absorbed. But for some reason, in that case, the absorption was very, very rapid. And if you put the images and plot them over time with calcium, you see while the calcium sulfate beads are disappearing, calcium is appearing in the plasma. Um, so it was, it was, and you still, when you go, by the way, now that I'm in endocrinology, you go over causes of hypercalcemia. It's a long table. Still no one mentioned that calcium sulfate beads can cause hypercalcemia. It can. Um, I, I, that, that, that one is published. I did the, an extensive literature review. There are many, many cases. It, it's not the first. Um, and what is unknown is why some patients absorb these calcium sulfate beads faster than others. That, I think that, that, that might be interesting. I have no clue why. Point is, you would treat uh, you would treat uh, conservatively with with hydration. Sometimes you would give Lasix or or, or furosemide. That's another thing I've, I've noticed in the most of the published cases. And usually it goes away in in few days. And indeed, that's what happened. And it was fully normalized, um, and didn't come back. All right. I think I think we might even have time for for one more. Let's hear the. Acute catatonia one. Acute catatonia one. This is uh, this is a long a long case and, and it took two years. Um, sometimes you have a hypothesis, but it's difficult to, really, to test and it takes a while to to have the results. But this happened in in again from my intern year. It was the first week of residency. Man, like, you're like intern of the year here. Like, what? This luck. is crazy. Yeah, luck, maybe. Uh, and, and and it was a busy hospital, so you're, you're exposed to a lot of patients. But in I, I was on call. It was my first call um, in, in residency in, in the first week of July. And I was asked to replace an NG tube that was um, pull, pull, pulled out. Um, That's how it always starts. It, it always starts like this. Um, so you go to the room and everything looks unusual. It's it's not the, the typical scenario where you would see an NG tube. It was a young young um, uh, man who was in what seems to be a catatonic state. Um, there was very slow movements. What really caught my interest is that not only there was... So catatonia is a form of rigidity that, that, that happens throughout the body, and there are different forms of catatonia, different causes. Um, perhaps one of the most common causes is uh, psychiatric disorders. Um, and, and that was... Comparing going back, my first catatonia case was in, 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 a, in a woman with schizophrenia back, back in, in Baghdad that had a perfect response to lorazepam, uh, which is the way you, you test it. You test by treatment. Uh, and, and, and so that I knew what catatonia looked like in the right scenario when there's schizophrenia and you give lorazepam and they open from, from the catatonic state. That was different. That, that person had no psychiatric disorders or a history of psychiatric disorders in the past. Um, no response to lorazepam almost at all. Really, really difficult to treat catatonia. Most interestingly, recent diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. Um, so the, the first idea that came to my mind is with type 1 diabetes, there are multiple autoantibodies 
that you can test for uh, that would confirm the diagnosis. First of all, type 1 at 30 is a little bit unusual. It, the bimodal distribution is earlier in life and then maybe in teenage years. But that doesn't mean that you don't see it later in life. Um, it could be a form of, of latent onset autoimmunity with some form of insulin resistance or what's called as LADA or pure type 1, as in this case. Um, one of the autoantibodies is, is called GAD or GAD65, which stands for glutamic acid decarboxylase. Um, it targets an enzyme that trans to remove a carboxyl group from glutamic acid to make GABA, which is the main inhibitory neuron. So when you have, and that enzyme present in multiple cells, including the pancreas, for reason I still don't know why, um, but also the central nervous system and the, and the, and the cerebellum. So if you have a form of cross-reactivity, perhaps, between the autoimmunity in the pancreas and that enzyme in the central nervous system, you have a central nervous system manifestations. And the most famous one, what used to be called stiff man syndrome, now it's stiff person syndrome, um, and a form of it is stiff leg syndrome, um, where the, disease, the, the name is self-explanatory. There is significant stiffness um, and, and almost... It's not catatonic state fully, but but a, a, a stiffness. Um, and it's it's a rare disease. Not many people have heard of it. Um, I think uh, a celebrity was recently diagnosed with it. I think Celine Dion. Um, the difference is, by the way, when you measure the antibody with type 1 diabetes, the titers are much lower than what you would see with, with stiff person syndrome. With stiff person syndrome, it's orders of magnitude higher. Um, that was my, my, my first hypothesis. Check the titles and see if that's what it is. He had, he had GAT65 antibodies, but the titles were very low. So that kind of makes it unlikely that this is related to a stiff person pathophysiology. But I, I, was, I was, you have to do your, your, your extensive workup to roll out any other possible cause of catatonia, any possible causes of, of central nervous system disorder. So, you have LPs, you have EEG, you have all sort of imaging. None of it was showing anything. I'm scanning the whole body, looking for occult malignancy that can have autoantibodies that, that targets. It showed nothing. Um, other explanation you would see with type 1 diabetes is Hashimoto. And sometimes um, Hashimoto can have what is called Hashimoto encephalitis. That's another thing you would look at. Um, one thing we noticed in the in the CSF, there was some mild increase in protein that we could we could not explain. Cells were normal, but protein was always a little bit high. No infection at all. We, the CSF was tested for infections multiple times. So, at that point, or oh, by the way, there is an extensively long panel of autoantibodies that you can test for. They all came back negative. We had many ideas. We tested all of them. That was early. Of, one of the ideas we, we had is because we, we, we really didn't know what else we were, we were dealing with. That was early, by the way, in the COVID um, days. So one of, the, one of the hypotheses I had is, well, it was a new pandemic. And the most recent pandemic before that was the Spanish flu in 1918 that was followed by an unusual uh, catatonic state known as encephalitis lethargica. Um, that was, you can get them out of their catatonic state with levodopa. We tried levodopa and it didn't work. It was not encephalitis lethargica. I would be surprised. I would have been surprised if 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 it was encephalitis lethargica because the the no one really know the 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 pathophysiology of that. At least not me. I, I don't know. But what was known that to happen after. Um, after the Spanish flu, which might have been related to molecular mimicry. Um, but many of them, as portrayed in the famous book and movie of the same name, Awakening or Awakenings by Oliver Sack or Sachs, um, uh, they would, it, it's, a, it's a severe form of Parkinson disease um, uh, acquired in, in, in early in life. Uh, which is not like the other early uh, in life Parkinson disease. Some of it are, is, is genetic, but they would respond at least briefly to to um, uh, DOPA or, or, or dopamine 
uh, agonist, but there was no response. So we, we were back to that's still elevated protein in the CSF. It's still telling us it's probably autoimmune and it's probably seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. Steroids didn't work, IVIG didn't work, and you have to really believe in, 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 in your uh, hypothesis once you exclude all the known causes and go up. Finally, rituximab after the second dose worked. And I didn't see what happened after the tuximab, but in my second year, in the end of my second year, I was in a diabetes clinic and the patient came walk, walk, walking to the clinic. I couldn't believe my eyes. And I asked him if he ever remembered me. He has no clue of who I was. Um, for some reason, he doesn't remember much of, 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 the, of, of the incident, but I didn't have the, re the, the resources to find what antigen that hypothetical antibody targeted. Well, we know whatever it was, it was, it responded to rituximab, which is an anti-CD20. So that's the humoral part. So, you know, it's most likely an autoantibody. Um, and there is an entity called seronegative encephalitis. Um, and, 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 and with more time and more research, possibly, newer antigens and targets will be identified. Now, as someone with type 1 diabetes myself, I kept thinking during the, that case, what if this happens to me? How long will it take for someone um, to have this idea? Um, so I don't have a tattoo, but if I ever had one, I would tattoo the PubMed ID of this case report on, on my wrist. <laughs> so if I'm ever in a phone, the answer is that paper, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe watch this episode. Yes. Yeah, you could get you could get the uh website for this external medicine this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we just we're going to give you a few rapid fire questions. Okay. Um so what is one medical truth that very few of your colleagues agree with you on? I'm sure there are many, but you can get, give us one or two. The simplest one is rare diseases are not as rare as, as you think they are. And of course, if you go in other parts of the world, it's even much more common. Um, so there is no shame in suspecting a rare disease. Um, and and, and, and if, if you think you're dealing with rare disease, you should test for it. Um, you will be wrong a few times, but in the few correct ones, uh, it will be life-changing and, and, and it's, it's really, it's really worth it uh, for the patients. They, they, they deserve to know at least, but sometimes these rare diseases have known treatments. Rare diseases are not as rare as, as, uh, as we think they are. If you had unlimited money for one randomized controlled trial, what would you study? It's difficult for me to think in terms of clinical trials um, because with clinical trials, you have to deal with known um, known medications. First of all, I don't know all the medications, but what I'm interested in is certain fields that I think worth all that money. Um, maybe more to identify ways um, what is really happening with insulin resistance with type 2 diabetes. This is something that I've always been interested in. Um, what is it in our environment? that is dealing with our genetics. Uh, and there are people who are working on this. Um, it, it's, I think oh, hopefully one day we, we would be able to reach that. But how can you reverse insulin resistance? How can you regain uh, beta cell function? And I think if you would really, really reverse the, 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 the physiology of diabetes, I think that that would change a lot in, 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 in human health world, worldwide. Spoken like a true endocrinologist. Um, once this is done, neuro neurodegenerative disorders and, and uh, will will take place. So I, I I'm all, I'm all, always thinking, what what is next after this? Uh, so it's not only that uh, you know, um, diabetes, but diabetes is a, it's a, it's a big deal. I mean, even though there are many good medications, there isn't. A matching good clinical outcome when you practice medicine in the real world outside the trials. And I mean, um, having worked in, in 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 multiple parts of the world and 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 
in non-academic centers, it's even though you have the best treatment, it's, it's still it's one of the main issues. I mean, you go to to a, a internal medicine ward or even non non internal medicine ward, and, and and you see what's the cause of admission, and you will see osteomyelitis and you will see stroke. But really, all this osteomyelitis, why? Well, it's from a diabetic foot. The stroke, why? Diabetes is one of the risk factors. It's always at the root, even though all these admissions um, and 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 really debilitating diagnoses, but diabetes, at least my somewhat biased view, seems to be at the at the root of many of these evils. All right, last question. What important scientific article do you believe more physicians should be familiar with? There is an article about a possible sodium channel and its correlation to metastatic potential. And if you knock out the sodium channel called NALCN, sodium leak uh, channel, uh, Nalkin. If you knock out this channel or if you block it, you can induce metastasis of even non malignant cells. So you've had kidney cells and brain and, and intestine cells and lungs, but they are normal intestine, normal kidney, not, not, not a malignant cell. Um, interestingly enough, gadolinium, as in the MRI gadolinium contrast, can inhibit, block this channel. And when they looked at the mouse model, that has knockout Nalkin, they develop fibrosis similar to the uh, gadolinium-induced uh, fibrosing dermopathy. So I th the two things, I the, the reason I think about this paper, because it's recent and I recently was going over it, it has a potential to disconnect oncogenesis from metastasis, and that can really be helpful in, in, in cancers. And maybe it's time to look at the safety of gadolinium. Um, that that might be a little bit of controversial in the beginning, but um, the data in that paper made me somewhat. Um, there is a term called theranostics. You're, you're familiar with that. I wonder if there are the opposite of therapy with with diagnostics, pathognostics, or something like that. Um, only future will tell. Uh, there's one paper. There is a, a really nice paper I mentioned earlier by, I think his name, first name is Lance. Can I double check? Lance Nature EBV Multiple Sclerosis. Mm -hmm. Nature, Clonal Expanded B-Cell Multiple Sclerosis by TV Lance. That was a very interesting paper that came out at the right time, uh, tying the pathophysiology of multiple sclerosis to EBV. And again, I mentioned autoimmunity a lot. This is one of the things that I'm, again, maybe from my personal background, but I'm interested in, and, and finding targets and triggers of autoimmunity is always interesting. Uh, the work that he and his group done was, was really interesting in how they identified these clonally expanded B cells and, and which target uh, that has mimicry between one of the IBNA um, antigens in EBV and, and a glyco, glycoprotein or glycam in, in um, neurons came in the exact time where uh, epidemiological data connected um, multiple sclerosis to, to EBV, I think all, all within, within um, uh, in, in last year. Um, yeah, the, the, these are the two papers that come in mind. Uh, surprisingly non-endocrinological, but um, again, endocrinology is not only about hormones and diabetes. Every cell communicates with, with each other, and as such, every cell can serve as an endocrine organ when you look at it that way. On that note, Assam, thank you so much for joining us on the External Medicine Podcast. We're going to um, link some of the articles that you mentioned. We're going to put up a link on our website also to some of your papers. Um, if people are interested in learning more about you, is there any website you want us to direct them to or are your papers good enough? Um, I, I am on Twitter, although I'm not, not active. Um, no, no website yet. Okay. No worries. Excellent. Um, this is great. This is so much fun. Thank you so much for having me. is 
for educational and entertainment purposes only. We do not endorse any healthcare providers or treatments. Our views do not represent the views of any official organization or institution. If you'd like to support us, subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review, preferably a phenomenal review. Visit us at externalmedicinepodcast.com and tell your friends.